The idea that humans will one day live beyond Earth isn't new, but it's experiencing a resurgence in popular discussions. Commercial flights to orbit, the imminent return to the moon with Artemis, movies shot in space and more seems to herald the beginning of humankind leaving its cradle for good. But are we truly on the verge of this epochal shift? Is it feasible? Is it safe? Some extremely little answer to this question come from Kelly and Zach Wintersmith, who have written a book on this topic, breaking down the many, many challenges of settling in space. Eiffel Science sat down to discuss it with Zach. My name is Zach Wienersmith. I wrote a book with my wife, Kelly Wienersmith, called A City on Mars. Can we settle space? Should we settle space? And have we really thought this through? Leaving Earth and starting humanity's next chapter on another world is a monumental task and will never happen without the proper research. But where would we even begin and what should be the focus? So what I would invest in immediately would be what are called closed loop ecologies. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are systems in which you essentially have a sealed container and you create an ecosystem in it. So, you know, the plants uh, generate oxygen. You have, say, animals that, uh, you know, breathe oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide. You get a cycle, basically a mini Earth, right? That's really hard to do. We've only done it a few times. Uh, the earliest experiments were in the Soviet Union in the 60s in a system called BIOS. Um, the biggest one ever was in Arizona in the US. It was called Biosphere 2. People have made fun of it a lot, uh, not unreasonably, but it was amply the biggest we've ever done, we being humans. Um, it was a 3.14 acre facility. So that's, uh, I know y'all don't use acres here, it's about uh, three uh, football pitches. And had eight humans in it and eight went in and two years later, eight came out. They, so it sort of worked, but by the end they were starving. They lost 10 to 18% of body weight and they were not like chubby people to start with. They at one point were suffocating. They were running out of oxygen. Oxygen had to be piped in, which will not be an option on Mars. Um, and there are a variety of other problems I could get into, but you know, it, it did kind of work. So a small group might survive, but is it scalable? The problem is if you want uh, as Elon Musk says, a million people. Well, so far the maximum scale we've done is eight, and we don't know how it scales. It could have returns to scale, but it could be it could be worse than linear, meaning like the people in Biosphere didn't have to generate their own power. They didn't have to build their own facility. Uh, they had access to medical care. At one point, you know, a person was taken outside the facility and given medical care. So um, we estimate if you just assume it scales linearly, you would need in uh, for a million people uh, a biosphere, a sealed greenhouse the size of Singapore, which, you know, is a bit of a technical challenge on Earth, obviously, but trying to imagine doing that on Mars, where there's almost zero pressure outside the window, is just extremely difficult. So you, you really want to invest in just learning how to build these internal ecosystems. Life on other worlds must be sustainable, and there are many challenges when it comes to the basics, such as feeding yourself. There is very little carbon on the moon, so, so meaning that uh, any plans that involve agriculture or, uh, you know, having more humans, humans are about 20% carbon, plants generally a higher ratio, and so you just can't do it. Uh, and, and for those of your uh, watchers who don't remember high school physics, you can't just make more carbon on site, it's, it's made in stars. Uh, and so it's a problem. Uh, likewise, uh, people will often talk about how much water there is in the moon. Like we have water in the moon, therefore we can build like a gas station on the moon and this, that, and the other thing. And the truth is there's not that much water on the moon. Uh, there, there is some, but it's a, it's a finite small resource. And the rules say whoever gets it first can probably take it and do whatever they want with it. Uh, so if you have a gas station, you might not have it for very long. But it's not just providing a supply of food and water, which could prove tricky. A crucial part is having a next generation. And it turns out that we know very little about reproduction in space, and even less so about humans making babies outside of Earth. Um, so this was originally something we just figured we'd take some notes on, and it evolved into a major chapter. And the basic finding is that one, we have very little data on reproduction in space. Certainly nothing in humans, very little even in mammals. We have almost no medical data on partial Earth gravity. We have a lot of medical data from zero gravity from the space station, uh, various space stations. Um, the results of that, the consequence of that, is that you would have to assume anyone trying to have a baby on Mars is going to experience problems both for the mother and the child. Uh, we don't know if you can conceive in space, it's plausible. Um, but, but with the exposure to partial gravity, radiation, and a lot of other factors, you'd probably expect a lot of problems. 
and that's compounded by the fact that you're in a hostile environment. So one thing we're concerned about is you get a situation where you have a higher than normal rate of children born with you know, difficulties, say, uh, for example, cognitive handicaps, you know, problems that we would normally be able to handle with services on Earth, but you're in a hostile environment where everyone has to pull their weight. And so what you find sometimes, and we quote some of these, there are space advocates, people who want to expand into space, who will say, well, we'll let natural selection take its course, or something like that. And in other words, it's a banal description of a nightmare. And so without that science, though, we really can't do this, and we have no science now, and it will take at least decades to get it. So that, that was a big surprise how much of a, of a stop that is on any plan. A lot of media about space settlements talk about the psychological toll experienced by those living and working there. Kelly and Zach's book has a lot to say on the subject of what happens when humans find themselves cooped up together for a prolonged amount of time. People think that if you put a bunch of people in what's called an isolated, confined environment, that's the term of art in the field, that they kind of just go crazy. Uh, and usually, you know, people will cite examples. There have been times when people in, in submarines have, have had acute psychiatric episodes. That's happened in Antarctica, which is another example. And what you find when you look through the data from like submarines, which are considered an analog for, for space, when you look at the data from Antarctica, what you find is an equal or lower rate of psychiatric issues compared to the home country. There's probably a lot, there's definitely a lot of selection. There's psychological questionnaires and analysis. There's also probably a lot of self-selection. I would not choose to go on a submarine, right? So, so it's people who are already willing to do this. And, and it's also just, it's not a perfect analog for what space would be like. But I would say, you know, whereas the finding everywhere seems to be that humans just kind of don't wig out when you put them in these environments, we also know that from simulated space experiments. You know, I say that, but it doesn't mean you're off the hook in space, right? So it, this kind of relates to the human reproduction thing, which is if you have 10,000 people anywhere, you're going to expect some rate of chronic psychiatric issues and very occasional acute psychiatric issues. So on Earth, we have ways to deal with that. You try to imagine how you would deal with that in space, and it's frightening. So on the ISS, and we discussed this, there's a procedure uh, that you're supposed to do for an acute psychiatric episode, and it involves tying someone up and giving them Valium, which uh, is something you can do in a place where you can get home in six hours in an emergency. On Mars, it's six months there, it's six months back, and there's a period of about a year where you cannot go home because Earth has raced ahead of you around the sun. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to keep someone doped up uh, for a year and a half? I don't know, it's, it's an open question. And so that's part of why we argue throughout the book that it'd be better to start with a lot of people so you can provide basic services. Um, so, so the nuanced picture is people really do not go mad uh, when they're in these confined spaces. Often they get bored or sad, but people are bored and sad back home. Uh, but you do need to deal with the just regular day-to-day -day issues and, and that usually doesn't come up in planning for space settlements. The future is always being created. The way we live now is in large part the result of societal rules and ideas which were founded centuries ago. So, will current research and studies define the path of any future possibility of space settlement? Or is there still more work to do? You know, a lot of the law of the sea we have now, much of which was only settled in the 1990s, but begins in the 1600s with, with like people debating what should be the law of the sea. In fact, some of the law we have no, now goes back to the ancient Romans. Uh, how we think about what a commons is goes back to you know, law in the, the, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so, you know, I, I always want to say to like, international law sounds really boring to young people. It's one of the few fields whereby being very smart and studying very hard and writing up your findings, you can really shape uh, how things might play out, uh, maybe even one day across the solar system. You know, the law regime we select, maybe in the coming decades for the solar system, may, may affect what people are allowed to do now and, and 100 years hence. We don't know. You know, we advocate for a system modeled on the seabed. The, the, the law we have now that governs what a boat can do in the middle of the ocean goes back to thinkers centuries ago and, and arguably millennia ago. As unlikely as it currently seems that humanity can step away from the problems we encounter on Earth, it might not all be doom and gloom. There is a path forward to space settlement. It's just almost certainly hard than you would expect from reading articles in the media. Um, it's also likely in many scenarios to pose a danger to Earth. Um, and so what that counsels is that we need a lot more science. Uh, particularly in biology and ecology, and we need a much more harmonious planet uh, to make this journey safe. So what I want to say is there is a path forward and most of the stuff we need to do to get there is stuff we ought to do anyway. And it's also, it, incidentally, really just really cool. Like there's so much science to be done, done on closed loop ecology, 
um, on like space obstetrics. Like imagine telling someone you're in that field. That's amazing. And then in, in the international law, creating a planet where war is less probable, terrorism is less likely. We need that to do space. And it would be a good thing to have in general. While research show that we are not quite ready for space settlement, if this is the future of humankind, research needs to begin now. But a lot of issues want and can be solved on the moon or Mars. They need to be solved on Earth first. And that is something which begins with all of us.